thankful to Pastor Chet uh, and for you, uh, for this church. Uh, you know, I've been reminded of lately of how Paul writes in his letters to various churches, uh, to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Philippians and uh, or Philippi, and just in all these letters, he's saying, hey, I've heard of your faith and love. I'm encouraged to hear of these things across the, the world, across the country, and, and that's what I would say of you here at Calvary South Bay. I've heard of your faith and love. I've heard from your pastor and been able to spend some time talking with him and, and hearing of how much of a blessing this church is and how God is moving and how God is using you. And so I'm grateful to be here uh, and I'm grateful to be able to share with you guys, uh, not just today, but I'll be doing a three-part uh, series starting today, uh, then uh, as well on Thursday night and next Sunday also. And this three-part series, we're talking about God's masterpiece and looking at this through Ephesians chapter 2. And if you would like, if you can, if you have a Bible, you can open with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And today we're starting with this, speaking of God's masterpiece, we're starting with this in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 10, which says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, we are so thankful for your word today. We're thankful for the promises of your word. We're thankful that we, we have your word to live by, to be challenged in our lives, Lord, to be more like you, to be transformed more into the image of Christ. And Lord, help us today to just keep our eyes fixed on you. And Lord, help us to understand and know what you desire to teach each and every one of us by your word today. We love you and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So here in Ephesians chapter two, uh, verse 10, we're talking about God's masterpiece. We're gonna be talking about that throughout this week on Thursday and next Sunday as well. Starting with today, this topic of the fact that we, the people of God, are his masterpiece, are his, as it says here, his workmanship. And as we talk about the we, uh, we talk about this as the people of God, the body of Christ collectively. This letter to the church of Ephesus was actually sent out in circulation to other surrounding churches and is still perfectly relevant for us today. This was likely passed on it to the next generation of church and the next generation of church. And now here we are, a couple thousand years later, still able to take the, this, this letter that was written to the, the church of Ephesus, and we can be encouraged, and we can be challenged, and we can be moved by these words. Of course, it is part of the canon of Scripture. It is the Word of God, and it is for us. It is alive today in our lives. And so this letter to the church, we can take it as a letter to us as believers in Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the people of God. So as it says we, it is talking about we. It's not just talking about a church 2,000 years ago. It's talking about us today. And we can be challenged by it and we can be moved by it today. And so the we is all of us, the body of Christ, those who have relationship with Jesus. And it then says we are. That word are is an absolute term. It's not we might be. Sometimes we take scripture and we don't take it for an absolute. But you know, when we read the Bible, especially when we see those words in red, if you have a, a Bible that has the words of Jesus in red, right? When we see things like that in scripture, we need to take it as an absolute. Uh, as, as the pastor uh, came up and, and shared earlier and prayed these words of all your promises are in him, yes, and in him, amen. 
And we got that word to be encouraged by today that it is an absolute, when it comes to Jesus and when it comes to the word of God, we are dealing with absolute statements. And this R is an absolute term. Bringing then into account, what are we? We're speaking of identity here. And today we're gonna get into this identity in Christ. It brings into account our identity and, and this, this idea that Jesus has, has been working at remaking us. That's what he calls us to through salvation. And here, this identity statement is a great challenge in our world today because you may have noticed that the world has an identity crisis. And there's a lot of things that feed into our identity crises in the world. One of them is social media. Now, I'm not a guy who's anti-social media because it can be very useful, but it can be very, very dangerous. Because you know what happens is we sit behind this screen we sit behind a device and we type out our little statements and we post our little pictures and we want the world to see that everything is perfect when you look through this lens of the social media. But the reality is our world is not perfect. Now I've got four kids, okay? From 12, they had 12 11, nine, and seven. Two boys, two girls. And we will post things on social media. My wife will get everything just properly situated and then take the picture and post the picture of the kids, right? Now, any of you who have kids, you know that the end result, the picture that gets posted on social media is not the real story, is it? Okay, 12, 11, 9, and 7. We are literally sitting there. Okay, stop, don't move. Don't, nope, nope, we got in a little early. We went down to the beach yesterday to see the, the Pacific, right? And, and wow, look at this. And, and here's the kids. And okay, you've got to do it just this way. You're going to take the picture. We're going to post it. And everybody's going to think like, look at this happy family. <laughs> they don't see the picture or the video of the five minutes that led up to that. That's everybody, you know, fighting. Don't touch me. Leave me alone. No, I don't want to. I can't see. The sun is in my eyes. And everybody's crying and complaining. You see, that's the reality. But when we put these things out online, we are having our own little identity crisis. And we're not giving the reality, but we're giving something that's not true. It's actually a facade. But we speak of our identity, and the problem is, guys, people don't know who they are anymore. And that goes for the church as well. We try to identify ourselves with what other people think about us. We try to identify ourselves in, with how we look, how we're perceived. Maybe you try to identify yourself with your possessions, the things you have, the job that you have. Maybe it's even the family that we have. And we try to identify ourselves. Even I can identify myself and say, I'm a pastor, I'm a dad, I'm a husband. These are labels that would properly identify who I am, but that's not identifying who I am in Christ. In the world today, people are identified by terms that are ungodly in every way. And what's happening in the world is we are seeing more and more confusion of the image of God when we struggle with this picture of identity. The enemy is working hard to distort the image of God, and he has been from the beginning. But you see, what's happening is as people, we begin to misunderstand or even abuse the grace of God. And that connects even back to the previous verse in verse 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
our works lead to an identity crisis. And salvation is by grace through faith. The work is not ours. The work is the work that Jesus has done. Now we continue, right? We are his. There's a possession there. We are his. We are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And our identity is actually, as believers, our identity is based completely on the work of Jesus and not our works. So then we get into the work. We are his workmanship. This word translated in the Greek is poema. It's just a nice sounding word, isn't it? You can say that in your own mind. You're like, poema, that's nice. It sounds great. And the, the meaning of that word is that it is a glorious or a beautiful work of art. And so when we read these words, we say we are his workmanship. We are his poema. We are his beautiful and glorious work of art. And that's what we're talking about this whole week. We're going to be talking about God's glorious work of art. God's masterpiece. He's been painting it for all eternity. And it was all a part of his perfect plan that he put it together. His masterpiece is so beautiful, so glorious. And we're, today we're specifically talking about us, his people, are his beautiful work of art. As God created in the beginning, God created a glorious work of art. We can look around us in the world and see the beauty that God spoke into existence. The creation around us. We see that God created man and woman and he created all these animals and, and the beasts of the field and all these things that are just truly amazing. He created man in his very own image. And the devil deceived and distorted the picture of the image of God in the garden. Sin entered the world. That was the beginning of the identity crisis. And Jesus, through his work now, has created life from death so that we are his glorious work of art. We are his workmanship. We are saved not just to escape God's wrath, but what's happening here is we are being remade into something new. Ephesians 2, 1 to 7, even before this, we can back up as it says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We were, in this section, it tells us, it gives us a picture of how miserable we were. And some of the words that we can take from that is that we were dead, we were dumb, we were deceived, disobedient, disgusting, and destined for destruction. Sorry, it's true. That might sound harsh, but it is the reality. That's the sense of reality that we need of who we were but made alive in Christ. 
We were all of those things, just terrible connotations. It sounds miserable, disgusting, giving us this picture of the gross things, right? I've got a squirrel problem at my house, okay? And at one point, a squirrel got in the wall in my house through an old chimney that was there, and and it climbed in, and it made its home there. I thought I got all the squirrels out, but I didn't, and I didn't find out for a couple of weeks when the smell began to set in. I had to cut open the wall and figure out that there was still death and decay going on. It was one of the most disgusting things I've ever experienced in my life. My wife is thinking, why is he telling everybody this? <laughs> to give us a picture of how gross our sin is. How disgusting our sinful ways are. And in those ways, God looks at us and says, I love you and I want to remake you into my image. You see, he created us in his image. Sin entered the world. That's not the image of God. But now by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are being remade into that same image the glory of Jesus Christ. So not only are we saved from all that death and destruction, but we're actually made new. We're made alive. We're remade into the image of Christ. We're made into something beautiful, poema, the beautiful work of art. Understanding this, guys, grace changes everything. By grace you have been saved. And grace changes everything. Grace should change us. At least that's its purpose, right? Grace is not for us to just do whatever we want and then we could depend on God's grace. Paul says certainly not. In fact, in Titus chapter two, it says this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's Jesus teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works." This is a great challenge to us, to walk in transforming grace, being remade. And I love what it says here in Titus, in the present age. So when we read that, we could read it today, we can read it tomorrow, we can read it a week from now, a month from now, 20 years from now, if the Lord should tarry. And we can say the same in the present age. God's grace is relevant. God's word is relevant. And God's grace continues to work and is for the purpose of change in our lives that we would be remade. No matter what the world's standards are and no matter what our circumstances are, We are remade by grace. Don't make his grace cheap by holding on to sin or holding on to compromise and trying to justify ourselves based on the world's standards or based on our difficult circumstances. I've been there. Dealing with some miserable circumstances in life and kind of just thinking, you know what, I don't really care. Life is so difficult, it's okay. I could get away with it for right now. Dealing with horrible pain and suffering and letting that be an excuse for living in the flesh. Paul says, certainly not. But the grace of God has a purpose and that purpose is to change us. That purpose is to teach us to deny or to end or rid ourselves of ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly here and now. 
in the present age also tells us we shouldn't wait. Right here and now, it's time for us to be changed by grace. And so then we we're talking about his workmanship, his glorious work of art. We're talking then also about his work and not ours. We established in the previous verses there that salvation is not of works lest anyone should boast, but his work. Salvation is not of our works, but we are his work. His work is his grace. His work is not to just improve our old ways, but to recreate us. To give us new life altogether, not just make better the death that we deal with. Not to just make better the sin but to actually remake us. This is speaking of transformation. If, and here's the good news, guys. If we are his work, through relationship with Jesus Christ, we are his work, then we are his problem. Praise the Lord. Our sin is then his problem. As we surrender our lives to him, we're like, Lord, I need to be remade today. Then let him do the work. So further then, this is, we're talking further about his work. Then it says, created in Christ Jesus. Jesus created us, made us as, as new creations, not just improving the old ways. He was, as John chapter one, verse one tells us, he was in the beginning with God. The source of life, John chapter one, calls Jesus. He created everything out of nothing at the beginning. And he, Jesus, comes to man to make us new. He gives us a new nature. And he clothes us in his righteousness. Now in the previous verses, we're told that we are made alive we are raised up together in Christ. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Chapter one tells us in Ephesians. This sounds pretty good. These are great blessings. This is all part of being in Christ. In his person. This is who he is. In his fullness, we get to experience his fullness in fellowship and in relationship with him. We receive the benefits of both the death of Christ and the life of Christ. Created in Christ. That Christ, as Galatians says, would be formed in us. It says in Galatians 4.19, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. We work hard in step with Christ, being remade into the image of Christ as he is formed in us. We have nothing to offer God of our works, but of his work. Surrender to him. We are created in Christ. He is working. He is moving through relationship, by grace, through faith. We are created then for good works. This tells us our purpose. What is our purpose here on earth? And maybe you're, you're showing up today, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and you're wondering, what is my identity? What is my purpose? Your purpose is to glorify God. Your purpose is for good works. Now that doesn't mean, again, we go back, we're not saved by good works, but we have a purpose to fulfill good works that he has established for us. These good works would be produced in us. This means there should be practical change in our lives. We shouldn't look like we used to look. Through relationship with Jesus Christ, through, by his grace, we are remade, right? Right? And if we're remade, we shouldn't look like the old man. We shouldn't look like the death and the decay and the disgusting things of our sinful nature. 
But if we're remade by the grace of God, we should start to look different. We should start to act different. We should start to sound different. The things we say. Paul says, let no, don't, no corrupt thing come out of your mouth. But what are the things that we say? What comes out? Does it glorify God? There should be practical change in our lives. Good works is the purpose. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That is the ultimate purpose. As for us as believers in fellowship with God, our purpose is to glorify God. How do we glorify God? Through good works. That he is working in us and through us. Good works are not to make us feel good about ourselves. Good works are not even to just make somebody else feel good because you did something nice for them. But if our identity is in Christ, then our good works are to bring glory to Jesus. For people to glorify God, who is the one who's working good works through you. Because apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And none are good but God. Good works are the fruit of being in Christ, and being in Christ will produce good works. You know, when, when we have relationship with Jesus, then we begin to have greater conviction of sin. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we should look like him. That's what his workmanship looks like making us into his image, clarifying our identity not to be confused as the enemy is trying to distort the image of God. But our identity could be clarified that we are being remade into the image of Jesus Christ to glorify him. Now these good works God prepared beforehand, it tells us. Before the foundation of the world, salvation was perfectly planned out by Father, Son, and Spirit. There was a, uh, God made a way for redemption. He made a way for us to be made alive. And he prepared good works for us to walk in them, to bring him glory, to keep us safe, to bear fruit, and to have purpose. You see, when we struggle with identity, we struggle with purpose. When we struggle with purpose, we struggle with identity. God addressed these things through his son, Jesus Christ. He gave us an identity through the blood of Jesus Christ, and he gave us a purpose as he made a way for us to walk in his good Ways, his good works, his good plan, his perfect plan. So that we would have a future and a hope. God prepared for us to be transformed. He's given us grace for the purpose of being changed. He's given us the Holy Spirit to produce those good works or that fruit in us. that we should walk in them. God prepared good works for us with plans to give us a future and a hope, that we would walk in his ways so that we would honor him. We should do it. That's the simple statement, guys, that we should walk in them. Paul is telling us this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to walk in his ways. We're supposed to glorify him. The word walk means a steady process of moving forward. To just keep going. Keep walking in his ways. Keep walking in the, in the good works that God has prepared. But what happens? We get selfish. We get hurt. We go through suffering. And when we go through suffering in life, we can't allow it to be an excuse. We can't blame God for it because it's the sin, it's the disgusting nature of sin that has brought on death, which has brought on suffering. God's desire is that we walk 
with him. And our response to his ways should be to pursue holiness. It's easy for us to just try to live life on our own, to try to figure out how to get through the day. And oftentimes, I will say there are many people in this room that you wake up in the morning and you think, oh, how am I going to get through the day? Or you're anticipating all the terrible things that might happen to you today or this week or this month or this year. But this is that we should walk in them. We should get up and go. Not just wait for the circumstances to hit us, but to get up and have a steady process that we are still moving forward in our relationship, in our fellowship with Jesus Christ, being remade into his image and giving glory to him along the way. Walking with Jesus to rid ourselves of the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Not walking with Jesus because we think it's gonna give us happy times. Again, all of this is reminding us that we are not saved by our works, but by his work. And his work is that we would walk with him and be remade by his grace. There's a quote, I don't know who it's by, but it's a good quote, so I'm going to share it with you. I'm not going to take credit for it, but works do not justify man, but a justified man works. We've got work to do, and there's great benefit to good works. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes in verse 9 and 10, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. That's the purpose further of good works that we're increasing in the knowledge of God through relationship. Peter writes that we are to add to our faith, not maintain our faith. We're supposed to add to it. We're supposed to keep going, that we would keep walking and we would see God further glorified more and more every day, not standing still, not comfortable or complacent that we have prayed a prayer and we call ourselves Christians and we come to church on Sunday or Thursday or both. Hey, praise the Lord if you come Sunday and Thursday. But what is God doing and how is God working in you each and every day of your life? And how are you giving glory to him each and every day of your life? We like to put the label, the title of Christian on us. But are we walking in a way that is reflecting the image of Jesus Christ? Because that's his work. We are to be glorifying God. There's great evidence that we're walking with God if we are glorifying God, if we were walking by faith, taking steps of faith. I want to close with this thought. Good works come from God's great work. And he's not finished yet. I know you've been studying through Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work, there it is, in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is God's work. He's continuing to work and he is always at work. Our responsibility and our response is to walk in his ways, to live our lives 
understanding our identity that is in Christ Jesus alone and nothing else. Who are we? Are we just putting a label on ourselves as Christian because we go to church? Or are we living our lives reflecting the image of God, which is our purpose and the identity that has been given to us as we are remade into the image of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for the cross. And we pray that by your grace, you would work in our lives today. That this right here and now would be a moment for each one of us to reflect, to look at ourselves and to challenge ourselves with where we're at, with, with how we are honoring you and walking with you and, and is, is our identity reflecting the image of Christ? Lord, I pray for any in this room who need to get right with you. Maybe are just playing the part of the Sunday Christian. Lord, draw them near. love you Jesus we thank you that you first loved us the Lord put this word on my heart to share with you right now to simply say it's time to get real with Jesus We live in a world today that is becoming more and more post-Christian. And for us, the church, it is time to get real with Jesus. So if you've been playing games, stop. Get right with Jesus here and now. Asking yourself the question, what am I doing that's glorifying God? Am I living my life in that way? Get real with Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's your first time here or maybe you've been coming and you're trying to check it out, trying to figure some things out. You want your life to be fixed. Maybe you're going through some really difficult things and and you don't know how to fix it. So you figure, let me try church. Give your life to Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with him today, know this, he loves you so, so much. And he died on a cross for your sins and desires a relationship with each and every one of you so that he could remake you into his image. Remembering this again, in the beginning, God created things perfectly. He created man in his image and sin broke that up. But God, who is rich in mercy, he made a way through his son, Jesus. He made a way that we could be remade into the same image once again. From glory to glory. And so if you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, that's where it all begins. And through relationship with Jesus Christ, you can invite Jesus into your heart. And through that relationship, as you walk with him and glorify him, you are promised eternal life. You are promised fellowship with him as you walk with him. And so I invite you today. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life as your Lord and Savior, 
I'm gonna invite you right now. Would you raise your hand? And if you wanna do that today, if you wanna invite Jesus in to your life, to be your savior, would you raise your hand? Keep it up so I can see you. I'm gonna just say, God bless you. And I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. I see you, God bless you. Anybody else? I'd love to see your hand so I can just encourage you. I see you there, God bless you. Anybody else? I see you, God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord, walls are coming down. Lives are being changed by the word of God. Anybody else? One more moment. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you raise your hand, you can pray these words with me. And it's not magical words in this prayer, but the work of Jesus Christ and that you would call upon him. So you could say, dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. And I'm desperate for you. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose from the dead. And I give you my life. And I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, uh, we have a team that would love to talk with you just for a couple minutes and, and encourage you, pray with you, and help you get started in your walk with Jesus. And so that's, you can head to the prayer room uh, this way, uh, right after service. There's a guy waving at you. There's a big sign that says prayer room. And we encourage you to stop by there and be encouraged to be prayed for and be ministered to uh, this morning. Uh, I, I've been told that you guys memorize scripture here at South Bay. And so simple word for us today in a uh, Selah moment, I believe you call it, right? Um, we're gonna take it right out of the message today, just a portion of the scripture to be reminded throughout this week. I want you to be encouraged by it, but it's Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, A, simply to say, and we could say together, we are his workmanship. You can memorize that, you can take it to heart, you can be encouraged by those words each and every day this week. Further, we have a challenge to change that Pastor Chet asked me to encourage you guys with. And so we challenge you to start each day by asking God to show you what his good work is for you. For that day, for this day, you wake up in the morning and say, God, what is your good work for me today that I might bring you glory? So let that be your challenge this week, each and every day. I look forward to seeing you guys again on Thursday and on Sunday as we study part two and part three of this series, God's Masterpiece. God bless you guys. <laughs>